Uh, we're very happy to have Heather Meeker with, join us today. A, a little bit about her. Um, she's a partner at the Old Melvaney and Myers Silicon Valley office and is a member of the Mergers and Acquisitions Practice Group. Her practice focuses on advising technology clients on intellectual property matters, including licensing and collaboration arrangements, software copyright, and patent issues, technology procurement, open source licensing strategies, and intellectual property related aspects of mergers and acquisitions and other, other corporate transactions. She is the author of Open Source for Business, a practical guide for open source licensing, which just came out and is available on Amazon. So if you haven't gotten a copy yet, uh, highly recommend it. As well as Technology Licensing, a practical guide from 2010, which is a widely used handbook for lawyers in the technology license licensing practice. She is re highly re uh, recognized for leadership in the field of intellectual property licensing law with Chambers USA, The Legal 500, Best Lawyers in America, and Super Lawyers naming her among the industry's top lawyers in multiple consecutive years. At Palomino, we've been very happy to work with Heather over the years uh, and uh, in terms of uh, open source licensing and other issues involving with the uh, technology M&A exit. We're very happy to hear her uh, give us our thoughts for the next hour or so. So with that, Heather, I'd like to turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, join you all for this uh, webinar today. I'd like to thank Palomita for hosting it and also like to thank everyone in the audience for attending today. Uh, as you heard, there's a place to ask questions on the uh, GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, please feel free to put your questions in there. We're going to leave plenty of time for questions at the end and don't hesitate to ask whatever you like. Um, so um, I'll say just a couple of things to start out about the state of affairs in M&A these days. Um, as it has become cheaper and easier to start companies, in the 2010s, uh, we're seeing that more and more uh, companies, and by the way, when we um, do acquisitions, we often refer to the company being acquired as a target. And so you might hear me use that word if you're not familiar with it. That's what I mean, the company being acquired. We see a lot of targets these days that have fairly little in the way of internal controls. And in a way, the situation is getting, you know, is, has degraded a lot, I think, because it, it takes less resources to start a company. That's a good thing, by the way. The fact that the internal controls are not there is not a good thing. And we'll explain some of the reasons why it makes a lot of sense to uh, have some uh, minimal internal controls, how that will help you with your deal. So uh, without further ado, let's uh, get started and move to the first slide. Okay, so the important thing to understand is that when you go from running your small company to being a target in an acquisition, you are entering the compliance zone. So the company that is acquiring you, uh, more likely than not, spends a lot of time on what they call compliance. And when they use that word, they mean a lot of different things. Uh, as you heard uh, from my introduction, I am mostly focused on technology law issues and IP law issues, but when uh, acquirers talk about compliance, they're talking about a lot of different things, uh, compliance with law, compliance with IP rights, as I mentioned, um, compliance with financial requirements, and so all of a sudden you're going, you may find yourself catapulted from you know, cooking along nicely with a small company where a lot of stuff runs ad hoc to somebody looking at your business uh, and expecting a fairly high level of compliance process that you may not have. And so there is a bit of a culture clash whenever there's an acquisition and you have to show your acquirer that acquiring your company will not cause them to um, go, to be contrary to all of their existing compliance because a big company spends a lot of time on this because they're a big target and they have a lot of assets to protect. Let's go on. Uh, uh, thanks. So this is, uh, I think, the crux of figuring out how to do compliance. 
Um, and, and I would like to pose the question, which answer will get you a better valuation? If they ask the target, please send us all your employee invention assignment agreements, which answer is best? First, answer number one, here they are. Answer number two, huh? <laughs> and this one doesn't work very well. Um, so if, for instance, you have a problem with your internal processes, it, it will generally work if you have an explanation for it. But being unprepared for the question really doesn't work. And a lot of what I will say in this presentation has to do with creating the right frame of mind for your acquirer. If they get the sense that you haven't even thought about some of these things, they're going to be concerned about your value as a target. Um, whereas if you say, well, yes, we know we should have been doing this, but we haven't done it for this reason, or we didn't feel it was necessary for this reason, that's a lot better outcome than simply being unprepared for the question. Uh, by the way, we see this constantly in open source software licensing, um, because that is an issue in almost every acquisition these days. And, uh, the, uh, and so, for instance, when a, an acquirer asks you to tell them what open source software you're using, if you haven't even thought about it, then that really doesn't look very good. And it, it causes the acquirer to um, view you differently. And we'll talk about that more in one moment. So let's go to the next slide. Um, do the dilly before the dilly does you. So in, in uh, m and parlance, dilly is diligence. It's, it stands for due diligence. So what happens in um, due diligence is that the acquirer starts taking a look at the books and records of the target. Uh, they'll ask you to provide a whole bunch of information, and you'll do your best to provide it. And if in that process you um, you react uh, with blank looks instead of, well, we don't have that because of X, or we have that partially in place, or whatever. As, the more you say that, the more nervous the acquirer will get, and the more information they'll ask from you. And anybody who's been through the diligence process knows that it can be long and tedious to do. So. The, one of the objectives is to present a professional enough face so that uh, you, so that your acquirer doesn't lose faith in you and start asking for more and more information, which will cause you pain and slow down the deal. Next slide. So the more professionalism you uh, display, the higher valuation you're likely to get. Although valuations don't get adjusted terribly often in the course of due diligence, they do sometimes. And when they do, it's usually not just one thing that causes the, the uh, price to get adjusted. It's usually a combination of things. So if there is a problem that your acquirer finds in due diligence, and it's just one problem, then they may be able to suck that up and live with it. If they look and find that there's a problem, plus your internal controls are so lacking that they're then worried about all the other 10 problems that they haven't found, that's when they'll start to adjust valuations, or even in rare cases, think about backing out of the deal. So here are some of the most common problems that require remediation prior to closing. And by the way, um, I want to make sure that I explain my terminology. So when you do an acquisition deal, the most common way to do it, although it's not done this way 100% of the time, is that you sign an agreement to acquire the company, and then maybe a month later, there's a closing, meaning that all of the administrative requirements to actually get the transaction done are complete. And on that day, the transaction closes, and you, are, uh, you have been acquired by uh, your acquiring entity. So there is typically, uh, although I say not always, um, a, a period between signing and closing. And it is often the case that if you as a target have some problems that you have to fix with your internal controls, the acquirer will ask you to remediate those uh, before the closing takes place. And the acquisition agreement may say that they're not required to close the transaction unless it takes place. In M&A uh, deals, uh, 
you know, having a deal crater because of a closing condition is a really, really bad outcome. Usually by that time you've already announced the deal, and so other potential acquirers may lose their appetite, uh, appetite that they might once have had. So you want to make sure that you don't run into a closing condition. Um, just going back to open source software licensing as an example, um, it's actually pretty common for acquirers to require some remediation of problems in open source licensing before they will close. And although it's often not a closing condition, it uh, is something that often needs to get done very quickly. So um, I, I have here a list on this slide of the most common conditions. Um, by the way, most of these are related to IP technology, but some of them are not. So First is disputes with founders. This will arise when, I mean, the, the, the typical situation that we see that's a problem is that uh, you started the company with your, you know, college roommate, whatever, and um, but very quickly you decided that your college roommate wasn't really adding anything to it or he or she went their separate ways, so they aren't part of the company anymore. And then when the company gets acquired and there's a payday in the offing, all of a sudden a founder who hasn't been part of the business for a long time decides that they should have part of your business. Um, this can either take place, in, take the form of them claiming that you had an agreement to uh, include them in the company so that they uh, own some part of the business, or it often is related to intellectual property because um, they might claim that they contributed some intellectual property to the business and that you don't have an agreement uh, allowing you to use the intellectual property. So th this is a fairly catastrophic kind of problem uh, that can really require uh, – it, it can really cause transactions to fall apart. If it doesn't, then it's definitely something that gets remediated before closing. Uh, mistakes in registering domain names. So this this is something that might seem like a foot foul at the time, but can be really problematic, particularly if you have a problem with your main domain name. So this is how this usually plays out. The company's just getting started, and the fr one of the first things you do when you start a company, as you probably all know, is you go and you, you reserve your domain name, because you want to make sure that if you're using a particular brand or company name, that when people, you know, type that into a, a, a browser, uh, your site actually comes up. So. The first thing you do is you go out and you get the domain name, but you often do that before the company is actually formed. And so it happens extremely frequently that domain names are not registered in the name of the company. When we do diligence on smaller companies, we usually see that they own at least a dozen domain names, usually for their main brand and maybe dot com.org, et cetera, and then they'll have a few ancillary uh, domain names that they also own. But you'll find that the ones that were gotten first, so usually the most important ones, are often not actually registered in the company name. Where are they registered? Well, they're registered in the name of the founder, or the founder who left, or the founder's girlfriend, or the founder's uncle who had a credit card. And uh, so, it's a real problem if when you go through your acquisition on paper you don't actually own the domain name. Why? Because if the person who owns the domain, who has the credentials to, uh, to manage the domain, actually claims rights in it or, or, um, or says that you can't use it or they won't renew it or they, will, they, they decide to point it to a different um, URL, then you've got some really serious problems. So between sign-in and closing, one thing that often happens is that the domain name situation is cleared up uh, or cleaned up. And so what you want at the end is that the domain name credentials for managing the account will be uh, 
associated with a person at the company, particularly one who is coming over in the transaction, and also one that is in the company name so that any requests to reset passwords and so forth will actually go to a company domain email address. I would say that domain name problems crop up in almost 100% of small company acquisitions, and uh, if if you can't bring your domain name along with you, obviously that's a very serious problem. Next is privacy policies. So um, a lot of people misunderstand stuff about privacy, and, and candidly, I don't claim to be the world's greatest expert in it, but here's the basics and how it plays out in a transaction. You all know that there are big privacy issues with collecting data on the internet, if you collect certain kind of personal information such as not only credit cards but email addresses, personally identifying information and so forth, you have to have a privacy policy. That's the rule in California. Um, and because you have to kind of uh, uh, adhere to the most, the, the strictest state rule, uh, most businesses try to adhere to the California rule, which has a specific statute that says you have to have a privacy policy that says certain things. It's very easy to look up the statute. So um, you have to have a policy, and very importantly, it, it cannot prevent the transaction from happening. So as soon as the transaction closes, your acquirer will likely have access to that information. And if that information is important to your business, then you have to have a privacy policy that says you can disclose that information to your acquirer. Uh, having a privacy policy that says, for instance, we won't give your information to anyone uh, is going to often cause a remediation event in a transaction. Now, these are a little bit easier to take care of because what you normally do to remediate them is to push out an update to the privacy policy that takes effect between signing and closing. How effectively you can do that will depend on what kind of information you have about your members or consumers or whoever's information you're collecting, uh, whether you can reach all of them, and whether you can get the privacy policy to apply going forward. So, uh, but this is something that often causes a remediation event in M&A. Failure to use employee or contractor agreements. I would say we see problems like this in almost every transaction uh, acquiring a small company. So when you are, and this is mostly, this is mostly something to manage intellectual property, although with employees it is to some lesser extent, uh, and with contractors too really, uh, to some lesser extent has to do with managing employment law issues. But I'll talk about the technology and IP aspect of it because that's what usually causes the biggest problem. People uh, generally misunderstand what the default rules are for intellectual property, but they're these. If you have an employee uh, working for you, and by that I mean someone who actually has an employee relationship with the company, meaning specifically that you are paying their employment taxes, um, that employee, whatever copyrightable works they create, actually belong to the company under something called the Work Made for Hire Doctrine. Other forms of IP, like patents, actually don't inure to the company, although the company might have some limited rights to practice patentable inventions that employees create during their employment. Um, for contractors, the rule is the opposite. Anything the contractor creates belongs to the contractor unless there's a written agreement to the contrary. And that's why you see people using contractor agreements that assign intellectual property rights to the company. So if you don't have the right agreements in place, it is possible that you don't own the IP in the company that you think you own, and you may not even have proper rights to use it. Um, it is not difficult to be compliant on this issue. Employee, 
uh, agreements and contractor agreements, they're not very complicated and they tend to be pretty close to a plain vanilla form, but you have to get them in place with people. If you don't do that, then you might find that you don't own the proper IP. And by the way, um, just so you'll uh, have heard of it, there is an acronym PIAA, uh, meaning Proprietary Information Assignment Agreement, and sometimes it's PIIA, uh, depending on like variations and what people call them. But those are agreements with employees that clarify that the company owns all the IP. And because there is the work made for hire doctrine for copyright, that's not usually the primary issue. The usual issue is patents. Those agreements um, uh, effectively assign the patent rights in, in inventions that employees come up with during their employment to the company so that the company can actually prosecute the patents. And then, of course, contractor agreements simply have assignments of IP. By the way, the forms of agreement that you use for these things are a little bit different in California from other states. Um, you won't be surprised to hear that we have some slightly unusual law in our state. Uh, and particularly because our state is, you know, producing vast amounts of intellectual property. So uh, you need agreements that are uh, suitable for the state that you're in. Uh, but once you've made that decision, they're not very difficult to get into place. You just have to make sure that people sign them when you bring them on board. Uh, undisclosed claims, that's, um, it, it's a general topic, but if people have, uh, made claims against you, meaning they've threatened to sue you or they think that they have a beef with your company. Uh, that is something that should be flushed out by the diligence process. And the thing is, they don't usually cause catastrophic events if you disclose them. But if your acquirer finds out about them between signing and close, that's a problem. Uh, by the way, the reason that might happen is that when you sign the document, you often do a press release, and then people start coming out of the woodwork with claims. So if you think there might be a claim, um, it's best to get it out in the open first rather than waiting for it to happen between sign and close and derailing your transaction. Uh, tax issues. Um, I mentioned this, I, I, I'm obviously I'm not a tax lawyer, but I've seen this happen quite a number of times. You know, M&A deals can be structured various ways. Uh, one way is called a merger, which is basically a transaction where the ownership of the company changes because the acquirer uh, gets a controlling interest in shares of stock of the company. Um, there are also... Um, there are also just stock purchases, which effectively do about the same thing. And then there are asset purchases. A lot of acquirers like to structure transactions as asset purchases, and the reason for that is that they're concerned about taking on the liabilities of the uh, entity. If, an, if the target has not been run with proper internal controls, there might be claims against it, and so the acquirer might want to leave those behind and just purchase the assets out of the entity. Also, if your capital structure is messed up or your accounting is messed up, they don't want to take on those liabilities. So what they sometimes do is take the assets of the company, just buy them out of the company, and roll them into the acquirer's entity. The thing is that those two different ways of structuring transactions, asset purchase versus stock purchase, have pretty different or can have pretty different tax consequences. And if you really want your deal to go sideways and be very expensive and time consuming to do, the best way to do it is to change the structure in the middle of the transaction. And that almost always happens because of a tax issue. So what will typically happen, and I would say this happens in maybe about 5% of cases, uh, so not too often, but it does happen pretty frequently, um, is that uh, the transaction structured as an asset purchase because that's the preference of the acquirer, and then sometime during negotiation of the transaction, the, uh, the sellers, the target, figure out that they're in a worse tax position if they do an asset purchase from if they do a merger, and then the, the transaction gets restructured or fall, falls apart. So the way that you can 
prevent this from happening is to understand the tax consequences of the transaction before you ever sign a term sheet. And that's pretty easy to do by talking to your tax advisor or a tax lawyer. Uh, I don't think it's a terribly complicated question. It's just that you have to understand the broad strokes of what the tax implications are for the type of transaction you're doing. And then employment issues, um, you know, uh, employment claims are very common and if you haven't um, engaged in best practices about employment, uh, there can be claims and if the claims are widespread uh, for your company, then that can actually kill a transaction. The, the way that small companies often get in trouble for this is that they use contractors in lieu of employees, but they treat them like employees. And it's actually quite common that the state of California decides that notwithstanding that you've characterized someone as a contractor, they're really an employee. Once that decision is made, then the employees tend to have all sorts of claims against you, overtime, um, taxes, you know, employment taxes, and so forth. And so you really don't want those cropping up during an acquisition. So before you go into the transaction, it's probably a good idea to sit down and think pretty hard and be self-critical about whether you've really complied with the employment law. And then <laughs> complete and utter, utter open source chaos, as I mentioned. Um, this just comes up in so many transactions. It comes up when there have been no con internal controls about the use of open source software. And uh, during the diligence process, the acquirer will say, uh, what open source is in your product? And you give them a blank look, and then they go and they run a Palomita scan on it and they find hundreds of undisclosed open source components and then there's a real problem and the transaction falls apart or there's, or there's significant remediation to do. Um, it is pretty rare for a transaction to actually die because of open source issues. I have seen it happen, of course, a few times. But what tends to happen more is that the acquirer loses faith in the target's ability to run their company and uh, and there's a lot of remediation to be done before closing. By the way, you should consider that if they lose faith in your ability to run the company, an, a, a corollary of that is that if you're going to be employed by the acquiring company afterwards, they're not going to have a lot of faith in you as a manager. So it, it it's just another reason to put a good professional faith, faith on your company during the diligence process. Okay, so let's talk about due diligence a little bit more. Uh, why do we go through this process? I mean, it's an expensive and difficult process. People complain about it all the time. Why do I have to pay such high legal bills for this? Why does it take so long? And there are basically two reasons for doing diligence. And acquirers will always do diligence because they really have a fiduciary obligation to their stockholders to do it. Uh, but there are basically two, um, two goals in doing diligence. One is to avoid unexpected third-party liability, such as IP infringement claims, employment claims, so forth and so on. And the other is to confirm the valuation of the deal. So you've set a deal price and they want to make sure that they're not buying a pig in a poke. You know, they want to make sure that you actually have the value in your company that you claim to have. So for example, um, if, if you are using some third party's intellectual property, and you're infringing, that would cause a claim against the company. So that's a potential liability that could arise after the transaction closes and then the uh, acquirer would have to deal with it. Whereas if, let us say that you uh, were intending to prosecute a patent and you forgot to do it and so you didn't have any patents, that wouldn't it wouldn't make as much difference to liability to third parties, but what it would mean is that your company doesn't have this IP value stored in it, and so that's more of a valuation issue. So those are the two things that acquirers are trying to figure out when they're doing diligence. Okay, so here's how the process works, and this gets down into the nitty gritty. Um, if you have been through this process before, then hopefully my words will ring true. And if you have not been through the process before, then this uh, 
should really help you avoid a lot of pain. So these days, due diligence is done almost entirely in online data rooms. You know, it used to be back in the day, um, really when I started practicing law, it was just getting phased out, uh, where you would actually go to a room and there would be a bunch of paper files and the lawyers would start going through them and reviewing them. Or, or copies of the files would be delivered to the people who are performing the diligence. Um, but today, uh, most diligence is done in online data rooms, thereby making things you know, largely a lot more convenient for people, although if you've ever used one of those data rooms, you know that they can be pretty inconvenient <laughs> to use. In any case, the online data rooms range from uh, companies that run uh, online services that are specifically for due diligence like Merrill um, or more informal things like Box or Dropbox or Google Drive or some other cloud sharing service. Um, so what you're asked to do is to, you're given a big long list called a diligence request of all the documents that the acquirer wants to see and you gather them all together and you load them into a data room. And that maybe it sounds, you know, pretty straightforward to do, and it is, but in fact data rooms are usually an absolute mess and they it's really better if you can be uh, better than the average data room when you put yours together. So an important thing is that they should be organized. Um, usually data rooms will contain about a dozen folders worth of information and you should make sure that it's organized in some systematic and useful way and the, the folders are named something intuitive. So for instance, you don't want to create folders, folders called contracts or, <laughs> or something you know, equally as, uh, as uninformative as that because every time someone looks at the data room, they're going to have trouble finding stuff. Um, you, you usually organize the folders according to the organization of the diligence request that you get. Um, but then as you go through the diligence process, one thing that will happen is that the people who are reviewing your contracts and, and documents will say, this thing is missing, could you please provide it? And then you update the diligence room. When you update the diligence room, you also need to be organized about that. And it's my experience that putting documents uh, that you provide in an update in a new folder that says update on it is also not extremely useful. Most of the diligence room, um, uh, you know, software tools will allow people to be advised when a new document goes into the folder. So in that case, you don't need to segregate out documents into update folders. If you do that, it, the problem is they'll often get missed and you might get multiple requests for the same thing. So the more organized you are and the more, the easier you make it to find stuff in the diligence room, the quicker the transaction will be and the less expensive it'll be. Now mostly the acquirer is going to be paying the fees or expending the resources for somebody to do diligence but also your own counsel or your own people in your organization are having to respond to diligence requests. So it's really not a good idea to just try to create a bunch of work on behalf of your acquirer uh, by making things hard to find or, or disorganized. Uh, so you have to make sure that the documents are, to the extent possible, complete, legible, and properly organized in order to uh, make the uh, diligence process less. Um, by the way, uh, some targets are surprised to learn that when they sell their company, if they're paying tons of legal fees to their lawyers, then that will actually end up uh, with a lower valuation for the company um, one way or another, either because of a price adjustment or because of, um, of cash adjustments um, uh, working capital adjustments when the transaction is done. So you want to make sure that you do the transaction efficiently and you don't create a ton of legal fees for either your acquirer or yourself. 
And the best way to create a ton of legal fees is to put up a disorganized uh, data room with a lot of stuff missing, illegible documents, and so forth. Um, you should always update promptly. Uh, when you get into the diligence process, most uh, targets will, uh, they really have a hard time uh, expending the resources to respond to diligence requests. Uh, it seems overwhelming. There's too much to do in the transaction. You're going through maybe technical diligence, business diligence, and legal diligence. And you've got to expend the resources to answer diligence requests because until you do, the transaction will not get done. So I, <laughs> I'm suggesting that you should have someone in your organization own this task and uh, it, it's really hard for outside lawyers to do it because they don't know your business well enough. They don't know where all the documents are and so forth. So I say put your Jared on, on this. I'm a big fan of the Silicon Valley show. And you really need somebody who is detail-oriented, um, persistent, and organized to put your diligence room together. And the, best, the better you do on that, the easier the transaction goes and the more professional you look. Okay, we're going to go through a few typical issues and disclosures uh, in uh, M&A deals. So this is getting down into the nitty gritty. Uh, we'll go through as many of these as we can. We might run out of time at the end, but um, uh, uh, we'll see how far we get. So. Just to explain at the beginning, when I say representations, when you do a merger agreement or an acquisition agreement, uh, there's a big long part of it that says uh, it is the representations of the target company. So these are statements made by the target company about the state of their business. And the diligence that gets done on the business will roughly correspond to the issues that are identified in these representations. I'm going to go through the main IP representations. There are many, many more about other topics. So the first one is to list all your IP uh, registrations. The average technology target doesn't have any copyright registrations. Um, they usually have some trademark registrations and might have some patents. So. If you have uh, trademarks and patents, it's likely you have outside counsel prosecuting those for you. Uh, sometimes the same uh, law firm will do both of them. These are often do done by boutique firms and not the same people, uh, lawyers who are actually hand handling the transaction for you. So uh, there will be something in the merger agreement or acquisition agreement that says list all of your IP registrations and you typically just get the list from the docket that your uh, attorneys keep. So those aren't difficult to do. Domain names, you need some internal records on. So if you're preparing for an M&A exit, you need to make sure that you have that information in a, um, in a cohesive way. If you're using one registrar, you should be able to print out lists from their online resources. It's a good time also to check to make sure that they're also filed in the name of the company with a company email address. Uh, so this is what we call a listing representation, or uh, it's just providing information. And so these are pretty straightforward. Inbound and outbound licenses. This is probably the biggest part of diligence, particularly for a technology company. What you're asked to do is to provide copies of all of your intellectual property licenses. When I say inbound, I mean licenses of IP from other parties to you, and outbound means licenses of your IP to other parties. There is usually an exception for sort of de minimis licenses, and so those will usually include on the inbound side, you know, licenses to Microsoft Word or to, you know, small, uh, um, software that has small license fees for which you're just an end user. Uh, so you usually don't want to list those, and in fact the acquirer doesn't want you to list them either. Uh, when you look at the diligence request, one of the things you can do to save yourself a ton of time is to understand the scope of this exception and not bother putting together any of the stuff that falls in the exception. 
Um, and then uh, on the outbound side, if you are a business whose main business is licensing intellectual property, such as a software business, then there's usually an exception for your basic end user license agreement. Or if you're in the business of providing uh, software to people who embed the software in their products, your basic OEM license. And whether these will fall into the exception really depends on the number of customers you have and uh, the, the amount of variation in the licenses. But usually an acquirer doesn't want to see a thousand copies of the same form agreement. They only want you to disclose things that are important um, or that are different from your basic form and then they'll want to see your basic form. Uh, whether you end up disclosing non-disclosure agreements is another thing. Uh, there's often an exception for these because they're they're pretty much, play, uh, let's go back uh, to the prior slide please, thanks. Um, they're, they're often, there's not a lot of variation in them and there can tend to be a lot of them and so whether the acquirer wants to see them or not is something that you should sort out with them. Uh, you don't want to spend a ton of time loading up the diligence room with NDAs if the acquirer doesn't want to see them. And then finally, you know, as the software uh, business has moved from on-premises licensing to cloud, there's a question as to whether cloud agreements are actually licenses or not. A lot of times they're written as licenses, but they're really more like services agreements. You want to make sure that you understand whether the acquirer actually wants to see these as well. And they'll typically only want to see them if they're unusual or large. For instance, if your main hosting provider is Amazon Web Services, they might want to see that agreement but you probably haven't negotiated special terms, so they'll probably just want to understand the business terms. Okay, the next um, uh, representation is non-infringement of third-party rights. What most targets worry about the most in M&A transactions is the possibility of infringing third-party patent rights, which it is not really possible to know with certainty whether you're doing that, and that's with the whole problem with patent trolls and so forth and so on. Um, so you'll be asked to make a representation that the operation of your business doesn't infringe the rights of third parties. And it, this uh, representation is usually pretty hotly negotiated. But if you know about any problems, you're supposed to put them on a disclosure schedule. If you are called upon to do that, you need to have an attorney write the disclosure because if you put too much in it, it can be a problem. If you put too little in it, in it, it can be a problem. I would say generally whenever you put information in the disclosure schedule, it should be very spare, factual, don't engage in a lot of creative writing because uh, it, it will backfire and the acquirer usually won't accept the language in the disclosure schedule anyway. But what you're normally required to disclose are any claims you've gotten about third-party infringement, such as cease and desist letters, or particularly in the case of patents, letters by patent owners uh, requesting that you license their patent. It's a good idea to flush this information out early rather than late. Uh, as I mentioned on the other slide, if you uh, don't tell your acquirer about a problem and it crops up, between sign and close or even after close, it can be a real problem for you. Uh, so don't hide the information. Uh, you know, your lawyer should be able to explain and advocate for you as to why the, the potential problem is not a problem, um, but hiding uh, the existence of claims is not a good idea. And I had mentioned this one before. Um, in, in the general issues, so there's, you won't be surprised to find that there's a representation about this. There's normally a representation that says that all of the IP developed by the company has been developed by employees and contractors who have signed proper agreements. And so targets often have to make a disclosure against this representation. Um, and I, I talked about this issue before, so I won't spend a lot of time on the slide, but if, you, if you're missing agreements from employees or contractors, 
you need to get that information together and you need to be prepared to explain why it shouldn't be a significant problem in the deal. Uh, open source, so the practices on M&A and open source have changed a lot over the last 10, 15 years. Uh, what is market today is that if your company is being sold, you will have to make a full disclosure in the M&A agreement of all of the open source code that is in your product. Um, it used to be that acquirers tried to get information about open source that you used in the back room and the trend has been not to bother with that stuff because it tends to be low risk. So what, you, um, what you're generally asked to provide diligence about and disclose today is what open source is actually in your product. Actually, saying what is in your product can be not entirely intuitive because if, for instance, you're running a, a SaaS or web-based uh, service, um, you know, the, the infrastructure software is usually not considered part of your product. And then you have to figure out, well, what's really in the product layer that makes us different and, um, and figure out uh, what, what, what is actually the important stuff. So it really bears having a discussion of that before you start the diligence process. If you are, <coughs> excuse me, if you're going through a, um, like a code analysis uh, consultant like Palomita, it's very important to make sure that you get the code to them that, that should be looked at. And defining what should be looked at and what doesn't need to be looked at is an important thing to do in these transactions. So the more time you put into that and the more clear you are about what the acquirer cares about and what really needs to be looked at, the, the smoother this will go. You don't want to give a, a code reviewer more than they need to see because it will waste everybody's time and energy. And if they find problems in third-party products that you haven't even developed, there's not even a lot you may be able to do about that. If you don't provide them enough, then if somebody figures that out before the transaction signs, it's going to derail the whole transaction. So very important to understand what is the universe of stuff that people are going to want to look at. And when you go through a, uh, uh, that kind of process, you will almost always find problems. And the question is, are the problems going to be a handful of small problems, or, or is your code going to be riddled with open source problems? And you know, it's my experience that usually targets fall on one side or the other, and there's not a lot in between. So if you have engaged in good coding practices along the lines, even if you haven't kept proper records, you're probably going to come out moderately OK on, on one of these analyses, but of course, uh, the more work you put into it and the cleaner your code is, the better and the fewer hiccups there will be in a transaction like this. Uh, I would highly, highly recommend that if you are even considering an, uh, an acquisition, which you know nearly every company is, um, that you keep really good records about what open source you're using. If you're asked to disclose open source in your product, and you're coming up with a spreadsheet at the last minute, um, everybody's going to know that you had no internal controls. By the way, um, information that you should include are all of the third-party open source components you're using, what version you're using, what license covers them, and how they're integrated with your product. Uh, you should keep uh, records about all those things. Um, if any of that information is missing, your self-disclosure will not look professional. And what's more, you may not be able to backtrack and fix problems very easily. Uh, data privacy is a big ticket item now. I mentioned that uh, privacy policies or lack thereof cause problems in M&A. Um, this is not strictly an IP issue, but it usually ends up being negotiated by the IP lawyers. Um, and as I said, a common problem is a failure to post a privacy policy that can result in a disclosure in the disclosure schedule of the acquisition agreement, but also 
if there is no way to bring the information over to the acquiring company, it may cause your company not to be as valuable. So you really want to do a website terms and conditions and privacy policy scrub well in advance of a deal. This is very easy legal work to get done. It is not terribly expensive to do. And uh, every dime that you put into it is going to be well worth it in an exit transaction. Uh, can we go to the next slide? There we go. Um, this, this is a big issue that, that is really common in a lot of uh, acquisition deals these days. Um, like the domain names, you have to make sure that all your social networking, networking and online accounts are in the company name and the credentials are in a company email address. So this happens so often it's just startling, particularly because um, you know, I've been focused on this issue for years and uh, I talk about it all the time and I'm just amazed how often it crops up. But here's the, the case that we all worry about. Um, you've got a great little business and it's a consumer facing business and you have an extremely active Facebook page, YouTube page, Twitter account, etc. And you find that the person who has control over this account who is managing it day to day is someone who is not coming over in the transaction. Uh, you know, a, a lot of times people who are doing this are kind of not very high up on the food chain. Um, and, and then you realize that when you have closed the transaction, you no longer have control over your Facebook slash Twitter slash YouTube account and the person starts posting a bunch of nasty messages about you uh, or flaming you and, and of course that is not something that you want to happen so you need to make sure that these are all in the proper company name and controlled by the company in a way that they can actually come over in the transaction and you should do that today before you get into transaction exit discussions. Uh, a few other items and then uh, we'll take some questions. Uh, I've, I've focused on IP and technology issues. Obviously there are a lot of other things that happen in a merger deal. Some of the other things you're going to go through a lot of business diligence. In other words, information about your revenue business model, top customers, suppliers, etc. You're going to go through technology dil diligence. Uh, meaning that um, your, your technology will be reviewed for its performance, security, and often export requirements. Uh, by the way, um, uh, companies like Palomida uh, also do work analyzing technical diligence as well as uh, open source diligence. Uh, you'll need to make sure that you have conducted the proper corporate formalities if you have a corporation, you have to have had board meetings and done minutes and so forth and so on. If not, you will have to fix up some issues before you actually get uh, the transaction done. You need to make sure that uh, your accounting is in order. Um, your uh, acquirer may or may not require audited books. Uh, if so, that can be kind of expensive and time consuming. Uh, make sure that you have uh, complied with the employment law and used offer letters, which is one of the prophylactics against employment problems. And then, as I said, uh, that you need to make sure that the tax analysis of the, the deal has been done before you start in on the documents in earnest to make sure that you're not going to be adjusting that in the middle of the deal. Um, as I mentioned, uh, Palomita, our kind sponsor, uh, does uh, audit services in connection with not only M&A deals but all sorts of uh, business transactions and, uh, and internal controls uh, on, on various uh, topics including IP, particularly open source, um, and M&A due diligence, um, internal baselines, vulnerability de detection and uh, divestitures. So if you are releasing a product, selling a product, buying a product, um, this is a kind of uh, service that can help you find and eliminate problems. 
And um, thank you, Heather. Again, this is Jeff Flush from Palomita, and thank you very much for that uh, informative uh, discussion on, on basically the tech exit here. I think people learned a lot. Um, I know I did. Every time I, I hear Heather talk, I learn something new. So uh, that, that was a great talk here. Um, at this point, if people have any questions for Heather, it's now time to type it into the question field on the right-hand side, the GoToMeeting, the GoToWebinar client. And we have a couple here to start with, Heather, and then um, I'm sure there'll be a couple more that come in. It always seems to be okay. the case. So um, you, it says you may have said this already, but how long should people budget for the process? How long does it take? And then if, and, and if things are found that are broken, how long does that take to fix, typically? So an average acquisition of a small company, uh, a small private company, it's going to take a month, a month and a half, two months uh, from the term sheet. The term sheet's usually done pretty quickly within the space of a week or two. There tends not to be a ton of negotiation of the words on the page, although there's often discussion of it. Um, it's, it's not, it doesn't tend to take that long. The actual merger or acquisition documents, they're long documents and they take time to prepare and negotiate. So rare to do anything in less than a month. It can get a lot longer than that. I think the longest one I've ever worked on was about four months and that was for a very big company which and a very complex deal. By the way, um, the asset deals are the ones that um, typically take a little more time because they're more complex transactions. You often have to identify what assets are coming along in the deal and which are not and sometimes there are uh, agreements to license stuff back and forth if there's anything remaining in the company after the deal is done and so forth. So those tend to take longer and be more complicated. Oh, and as to, as to remediation, that really depends. Um, as I said, the period between signing and closing can range from zero, some transactions sign and close on the same day, to an average one would be about a month and people try to close them faster. It's just that that's the outside deadline. If you have a really big transaction, and I don't think we're really talking about that here, but you can have to go through antitrust review and so forth, and that can take a six months, a year to do. But, um, but for an average small company, it's usually about a month, and so you try to get all the remediation done within that time. Great. Thank, thanks, Heather. Um, next one here is, um, let's see, one just came in here that says, um, what guidance do you have for small companies that usually do not have much bargaining power in negotiating customer contracts with larger entities? Um, so I ask because some of these contracts lead to things that are not attractive to the acquirer, such as source code escrows, indemnification terms, et cetera. Yes, yeah, so um, I I feel your pain. I work for a lot of small companies selling to big customers, and the fact is that sophisticated people doing M and A deals understand that small companies have to give away a lot in their in their day to day business transactions. I mean the. The conventional wisdom is the first deal you do is the worst, and then they all get better from there. Um, so when somebody is doing diligence on your company, you, you sort of have to hope that they're people who actually have some business experience. I mean, for instance, I do day-to-day -day transactions and I also do M&A, and I think most people who are in the tech transactions practice do that. It's very important that they do both because that means that they have a sense of what is market and particularly what is market for a small company in a day-to-day -day business transaction. So hopefully you will find people who look at your stuff in diligence and say, well, yeah, this doesn't look too good. This is really bad indemnification provision, but, you know, hey, we'll renegotiate it on the next turn or whatever, right? Um, unfortunately, you can sometimes get people who, you know, have a tizzy over every little problem and that, that's, that's really unpleasant. Um, fortunately, their, their clients will usually, uh, you know, 
say, well, I don't really care about that. So if you're really uh, getting at loggerheads with the attorneys on the other side of an M&A deal, you need to bring their clients in to make a reasoned business decision. As to exercising ba bargaining power in day-to-day -day transactions with bigger companies, there's only so much you can do. I mean, you really have to consider, and people on both sides of the transaction need to consider this, a couple of things. First, you know, this always comes up around things like indemnities and warranties and liability. And a kind of modal case is uh, your, your customers want you to take on unlimited liability for data breaches. Okay, that's a big ticket issue in day-to-day -day transactions these days. And you have to consider that a small company doesn't have a lot of capital, they might not have a lot of insurance, and so the unlimited liability is only theoretical because once you strip the assets out of the organization, there's nothing left. You can't get blood from a stone. So people need to consider that small companies can only bear so much liability, and, and if you're insisting on $100 million in liability, you really need to look at what company is giving you the indemnity or the warranty because you're probably not going to get that much money out of them. Um, the other thing is that whenever you're talking about liability issues and contracts, you really want to focus on what is the marginal liability. So what I mean is if you have, say, a data breach, um, you're going to be liable directly, and if you give an indemnity to your customer, what you're taking on is claims against the customer. But if most people would be suing you anyway, it's maybe not that much of a give. So you need to be practical about this stuff and think about how the liability uh, plays out in the in the real world, and um, and hopefully you get everybody else that you're doing transactions with to do the same thing. Great, great. Thanks. Thanks for that reply. Um, just. It is after 11, people may be dropping here. I just wanted to get in a plug for Heather's new book, um, Open Source for Business, A Practical Guide for Open Source Licensing. So if uh, you're interested, go check it out on Amazon um, under Heather Meeker's, Meeker's name. I've got one last question here I'd like to uh, get before we drop, which it talks about, it says, I understand it's important to disclose open source software components in the product and their licenses. Are there any other vulnerability issues with the software that should be identified or disclosed during the diligence phase? Well, so most companies will go through a technical diligence process as, along with a legal diligence process. If we're, if, if we're talking about, say, security vulnerabilities, you, you need to be careful about how you disclose those. By the way, I would never put those in a disclosure schedule for an M&A document because people might be able to access and read it somehow. Um, there's a certain amount of consideration you need to give to what actually gets disclosed in the M&A document and what doesn't. I, w I think it's best to handle things like security vulnerabilities um, on a, uh, in a way that doesn't end up with significant disclosures in, in the document. Um, so you can, for instance, say uh, in, a, in a representation, we, uh, we don't have any security vulnerabilities except as previously disclosed to the buyer and, and not actually write it out in the contract because the information is going to be sensitive. But yeah, acquirers may go through a lot of uh, technical diligence. They may want to get a sense of the quality of your code, whether it's commented correctly, how cleanly it's integrated with other stuff, whether your build instructions work properly, uh, security review, export review, all sorts of things like that. By the way, export review is usually is like code for what encryption you have in your software and uh, what rules apply to that. Great, great. Well, well thanks so much, Heather, and, and thanks for everybody who joined us today on this webinar. It's always uh, we always learn something, and I definitely learned something today. If you have any follow-up questions, please don't hesitate to either contact Heather at hmeeker at omm.com. Her phone number is there as well. And if you have any questions or comments for Palomita, uh, our email address is info at palomita.com. And this is Jeff, Jeff Lush at palomita.com. Please feel free to give me a call or, or write me as well at jeff at palomita.com. And please follow us on Twitter at palomita underscore inc. And our website is palomita.com. So hope you join us for our next webinar.
and again, I really want to thank Heather Meeker for the really informative webinar today. Uh, join Thanks us. Thanks very much. Thank you, Heather. Bye-bye. <laughs>